one, I think we will get started. Good afternoon, and thank you for attending this month's Teach Educational Round. Here with us today, we have Dr. Carolyn Lemsky, Robbie Miller, Trisha Dunbar, and Dr. Peter Selvey, who will be presenting on acquired brain injury and smoking cessation. But before I hand it off to our presenters, I'm just going to go over a few housekeeping slides as per usual. First of all, if you are interested in obtaining a letter of completion for this month's Teach Educational Rounds, please make sure that you have registered for the webinar and completed the pre-learning assessment. You have signed in to view this webinar using your first and last name so we can track your participation. And finally, you complete the evaluation and post-learning assessment, which will be emailed to you this afternoon, and you will have one week to complete that. These webinars are being live tweeted on Twitter, and you can follow us at PS Quit Smoking or use the hashtag TeachWebinar to post or read questions. Here are some biographies of our faculty presenters, and Dr. Selby is going to introduce them. Uh, thank you, Stephanie. I hope everybody can hear me. Um, Loud and clear. Stephanie, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, great. Excellent. So. It gave me great pleasure to introduce my, uh, my colleague, uh, Carolyn Lemsky, who I've been working with for a few years now. And as you can see, she's a board-certified neuropsychologist and the clinical director at CHERS, the Community Head Injury Resource Services of Toronto. And they really help a lot of people uh, with, uh, who have, are living with the effects of acquired brain injury. And more importantly, or not, uh, equally importantly, is that she's the director of the Substance Use and Brain Injury Bridging Project, which is a, a knowledge transfer initiative funded by the Ontario Neurotrauma Foundation. Uh, you know, she's an excellent collaborator. She's an excellent thinker about this, that this issue, and, and, and as a clinician and as a, as a planner, has also brought in a lot of, of uh, scholarship to this, including contributing to book chapters and articles on the neuropsychology and brain injury literature, and I have to thank her for uh, uh, encouraging me and, and uh, to be involved in this work with uh, acquired brain injury. Uh, our second presenter is Dr. Roby, uh, is Roby Miller, who is a behavior change therapist at CHERS. She has over 10 years of experience developing interventions for people living with ABI and co-occurring mental health and substance use disorders. And she's a founding therapist of the Chair Stop Clinic. So we, as you can tell, we have a collaboration with them around how to integrate stop smoking services for people with acquired brain injury. And lastly, uh, Trisha Dunbar is an RPN, is a service coordinator at Chair. She has over 10 years of experience providing leadership, uh, both residential and outreach programs, and coordinates the care of individuals who have concurrent mental health, substance use, and acquired brain injury. So, going on to the next slide, if I can do that, yeah. Uh, disclosures, no disclosures from uh, that group. Uh, people are very familiar with who I am, Dr. Peter Selby, and my disclosures. So, uh, I'm not going to spend much time on that. And um, uh, this is the, the slide about TEACH and TEACH curriculum development. The disclaimers, as we are talking about general uh, principles and approaches to assessment and treatment. And again, does not, uh, you know, it does not, um, we're not pre presenting an official position of CAMH in, in any way. So what are the learning objectives? Uh, today we just want to examine how cognitive impairments may alter the approach to uh, substance use disorders, uh, explore adaptations of mainstream treatment using a case-based approach, and then three is discuss development of a cessation treatment program using a case-based approach. So I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Lemsky and her team, and at the end I'll come back and we will be I uh, will discuss some of the things that uh, uh, we talked about, and uh, and as well you're always welcome to use the, the column on the side to uh, for uh, to ask questions. So just going to hand it over to you, uh, Callan. Uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to come and share this information, and um, it's, it's really nice to see that uh, there's so many interested people keeping up with the teach round. So, so thanks. It's, it's been um, a fantastic learning experience for us and our team, uh, learning how to do smoking cessation interventions. So what we're going to share with you today are a couple of cases and then a very, very quick overview of some information about um, substance use uh, or, and brain injury as well. Uh, the first case that we're going to be talking about is a 51-year-old man who, um, who, he's now 51, 
And he had his first symptoms of schizophrenia uh, as a young adult, and about three years after diagnosis, sustained a very severe brain injury as the result of a suicide attempt. Um, and today, uh, now many years at post-injury, he ha still has residual uh, mild disinhibition, anxiety, and impulsivity. Um, his symptoms of schizophrenia are very well managed on clozapine, um, but he is living with some cognitive dysfunction that includes um, problems with attention, concentration, memory, judgment, decision making. Um, this case was chosen because it was one where we really had quite a lot of influence over environmental factors, so we could use it to illustrate some of the things that we do when we have that luxury. Um, and, and he lives in one of our 24-hour uh, supported group homes, but he also has independent access to the community, so he goes out and does his thing and participates in programming. Now, over the years, he's been a fairly heavy smoker, but uh, budgetary constraints have reduced his smoking to about 15 to 20 cigarettes per day. He has a very collaborative and supportive relationship with the folks over at the group home, and he has asked for help in rationing himself, uh, or had asked for help in rationing himself, so they were holding 15 cigarettes for him and giving him daily so he wouldn't oversmoke his aliquot. Um, he was very motivated by the time we started the intervention uh, to quit for his health, to save money, and because of his age and family history of smoking. But I will say he'd been asked to quit smoking for a very long time, and he was a part of my regular sort of clinical follow-up um, clients. And uh, I used to slip in, I saw him about once a month, and I was sort of slipping in motivational interviewing over the period of about a year to help him to get ready uh, to stop smoking. He was pretty anxious, as you'll find out, about the withdrawal effects, and he was worried about agitation and cognitive uh, fog. He's a slender man, but he was still worried about uh, waking that might result. Now, our second case is e has a very complex history, too. She's one where we had some influence over the environment, but considerably less, as we'll discuss. And she's a 40-year-old woman with a history of anoxic brain injury related to opioid use. And her history of substance use disorder goes back to her teens and early adulthood when she had um, pretty significant polysubstance abuse and in her early 30s had the overdose. Now, post-injury, now pre-injury, she had uh, an anxiety disorder, eating disorder, and post-injury developed pancreatitis and osteoporosis as well as um, chronic pain. She had a lot of clinical ups and downs and had been quite unstable for a number of years, but really settled in quite nicely on Suboxone. Uh, and um, she has only some mild complaints of pain. Cognitively, she has some memory impairment, um, but she has moderate difficulty with planning and problem solving and impulsivity, as we're going to talk about. She has some motor problems that include ataxia, left foot drop, using a cane and a walker. She had a history of falls, and, and that really was what catapulted her into the um, to the uh, desire to quit smoking because she broke her clavicle, had bad healing and needed surgery that she really wanted to improve her mobility, but wouldn't be allowed to get that surgery unless she stopped. She was somebody who was smoking very impulsively, um, almost chain smoking. And over the years that we'd been involved with her, we'd been intervening um, with nearly losing her housing because she'd been smoking in an unsafe manner, burning her bed clothing um, and, uh, and furniture. Um, but in the context of the co upcoming surgery, she was definitely willing to work on her smoking cessation. So that's a brief overview of two pretty complex cases and pretty, um, I would say, uh, um, fairly uh, representative of the folks that we work with here at Shears. So now I'm going to give, oh boy, a whirlwind tour of some of the ways in which cognitive impairments might alter the approach to treatment for substance use, and we'll end um, the presentation with some information about where you can go to learn more about this because this is going to be a very, very quick overview. So I think everybody's pretty familiar with how prevalent brain injury is in Canada. Um, more prevalent, I guess, than breast cancer, spinal cord injury, and multiple sclerosis combined. Most of those injuries are mild, and in addictions and rehabilitation settings, what you're going to notice is that there's a higher prevalence of folks with uh, mild traumatic brain injuries uh, seeking services in those settings than um, in the general population for a variety of reasons. Now, the particular relevance of, of uh, brain injury to smoking cessation is that there is evidence that uh, kids who sustain concussions early on are more likely to become involved with substance use generally, and that includes um, uh, smoking as well. 
But also if you're working in addiction settings, and I, I know that most of you or many of you are, uh, as many as 70% of the folks that you're working with in concurrent treatment disorders report a history of TBI with loss of consciousness. And, and um, what we know from the um, research that Peter and I have done together uh, and uh, what's available in places in the states is that when there is a TBI history present and a person is, is discussing or um, seeking treatment for substance use disorder, their symptoms tend to be more complex. There's more mental health co-occurrence co um, and, and there's more behavioral difficulties. So in individuals who are cognitively impaired, smoking really impedes access to housing and health care. So these are folks who, don't, who have a hard time smoking in a safe manner, have a hard time complying with rules, and are really very often likely to get kicked out of, of their housing. The relationship between substance use and brain injury is really complicated, chicken and the egg situation. There's evidence that substance use is a risk factor for developing TBI, um, head injuries that occur with accidents while intoxicated. Um, but there's also um, a lot of data that says that, that when you have a TBI, you have more symptom complexity. You're more likely to be emotionally dysregulated, more likely to be anxious, more likely to be depressed. And that probably has to do with the nature of the brain injury itself. And in any case, with these differences, an altered approach to care is really um, likely. Now, I guess if I'm going to give a really quick overview, the first thing I want you to know is that the pattern of brain injury isn't random, that there are certain brain structures that are really a lot more vulnerable to traumatic injury. And as this, this um, graphic indicates, uh, it's meant to be sort of like a scatter plot of brain injuries. So the areas that are more densely colored there represent more injuries um, that have occurred in that area in a series of patients. So you can see um, that they tend to cluster around the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe. And those are spots where um, there's a lot of important uh, machinery for the reward system and for memory. So the functional correlates of where those cortical injuries are occurring are um, memory, the processing of emotions, the processing of awards, social cues, and the ability to focus attention. So, you know, and that, of course that comes into play quite a bit in addictions care because we're looking, um, people who have difficulty in um, not focusing on the cues for using and um, focusing their attention elsewhere. So how might TBI trigger addiction? Well, the structural and physiological lesions to areas of the brain that are involved with those executive abilities, processing emotion and reward and judgment. Um, changes in neurotransmitters themselves also occurs, including the dopamine trans, uh, transporters. And, and that seems to increase the risk for depressive and anxiety. We find that in folks who have traumatic brain injury, those systems are actually operating less efficiently. And those systems, uh, dopamine is also highly involved in executive functioning and the focusing of attention, uh, which makes sense if you think about how that interacts with um, a person's willingness and ability to seek rewards in a meaningful way. But there's also psychosocial changes, including social isolation and alterations in lifestyle that occur when a person becomes disabled and is less able to participate in the normal daily activities that they would like to do. Um, I included this because I know I think folks get slides for reference, and I think that this is a really good uh, slide to um, point out that the cortical areas, the areas on the surface of the brain that are involved with um, planning and problem solving, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, and emotional processing, the orbital frontal cortex, and the temporal pole with memory and emotional um, machinery are really all very highly involved in, um, or highly vulnerable to brain injury. Now, again, oversimplified in this explanation, but something that if you're interested, uh, it's really kind of fascinating to learn more about. Uh, in addition to those injuries that occur on the surface of the brain, axonal injuries, the stretching and pulling of axons during these concussion injuries creates a disconnection syndrome. So that, um, and you can see in this graphic, the, the brain on the left-hand side, this is a diffuser tensor image. And what it does is it looks at the connecting fibers between important areas of the brain. 
And what you can see are these coherent patterns back to front, side to side, and these, those red fibers that go through the brain and connect both sides of the brain. The severe axonal injury there uh, on the right-hand side shows that those connections no longer have integrity. You might not see that on a, function, uh, on a static image like a CT or an MRI scan, but when we're looking at how the brain functions, we see that the brain is functionally disconnected. So um, uh, these um, injuries occur on a continuum. So you'd have, of course, less of that effect in a concussion, and in a concussion it may actually resolve to a certain extent. And the more concussions that accumulate, maybe the less resolution you have. And in severe brain injury, uh, those, um, those disconnections are permanent um, and um, significant. So the ways that brain injury affects smoking cessation, cognitive impairment. And the most common cognitive impairment that you're going to run across is cognitive slowing. So when you're in, in um, counseling settings, accounting for the fact that the person may not be processing information as quickly or as deeply. Memory impairment, so remembering from time to time attention, um, and executive dysfunction, um, which we'll talk about, problems with planning, self-monitoring, problem solving, and also get up and go to initiate activities. Now, social communication is also a very common problem in people with acquired brain injury, and that's the ability to read social cues, to um, express oneself without becoming tangential, or um, and understanding how their message is landing, um, speaking in a way that considers who they're talking to. All those social communication factors um, can also affect smoking cessation in both in the therapy process and in their ability to um, address triggers in the community. And of course, emotional dysregulation. And the important concept here is that a lot of our clients have more, they experience inf um, uh, emotional triggers more intensely and they have fewer automatic inhibitions. So when, we, when they're in a difficult situation where they know that they really shouldn't express their anger, it, it, it may become, uh, it may be expressed in, in sometimes inappropriate or in explosive ways. And again, it's all a matter of degree. These, th these problems can be subtle or they can be very severe. And we often find that people after concussions will say, you know, I was kind of irritable. I, was, I, had, a, I had a worse temper. Uh, the increase in impulsivity can be thought of as, uh, and especially this is true in more severe injuries, individuals whose reward system is tilted in the direction of immediate gratification. So they have a greater difficulty in um, uh, delaying their gratification on something that, that we call delay discounting. They discount the advantages of delaying gratification. So functionally, they may have a hard time having continuity of experience, remembering how their previous experiences may inform what they should do in the future, learning from their experiences, generalizing strategies from one setting to another, communicating effectively, and processing information effectively. <clears throat> in terms of emotional dysregulation, these are clients who are more dysregulated. They also have more trouble planning, so they have fewer coping strategies. And smoking or moving away from the group to smoke may become a coping strategy as well as other substance use. And again, as we've been talking about, they're more triggered by their environmental stimuli. And then there's also the problem of just the loss of other social opportunities, boredom uh, that occurs. This is um, actually one image that we use from our smoking cessation um, posters, Ask Me How I Quit. And one of the things that we try to do to mitigate stigma for our clients, because a lot of our clients will come to us when, in the quitting process and say, well, you know, I have a major mental health problem. I have addictions. I also have a brain injury, and now you're going to ask me to quit smoking. I don't think I'm up to it. Uh, and so we wanted to show that their peers, folks that, that are involved in the programming, the people they know have successfully quit. Um, and so we use these Ask Me How I Quit posters. So one of the, the tasks that you're going to want to do if you notice that a person has a history of acquired brain injury is reducing the cognitive load in counseling sessions. So just simply by reducing distractions, slowing messages down, limiting them to one idea at a time, allowing time to process information, um, repeating important information, providing visual cues and written cues, 
um, making frequent summaries, and particularly in MI, making concrete summaries, maybe even considering um, the careful use of metaphors um, and um, very frequently uh, repeating or reminding a person of their own change talk. And then um, checking for a client's understanding very frequently. In service delivery, these extended periods of engagement, like I discussed, you know, in my regular treatment settings with both of the clients we're pressing today, I spent a little bit of time um, doing some motivational counseling related to their um, related to their conversation. <coughs> the visits for um, our um, therapists, and they'll talk to you about that, were more frequent. Um, and we also were active in helping clients to remember to get two sessions and tried to plan them in, at times when perhaps clients would be at our head office anyway and did whatever we could to eliminate barriers. And the peer modeling, as I discussed before, was a very big, uh, a very big part of the program. Um, very often in our setting, we're looking at mitigating the risks of smoking as a safety hazard, which may not come up a lot in your practice, but. Um, you know, we, we were developing harm reduction programs like only smoke at the table, keep your cigarettes out of reach from your bed so that you're not impulsively um, setting alarms, having staff members or others um, have limit access to cigarettes um, in a consensual way. Alarms aren't really very effective smoke alarms though that we found. We've tried, um, we've looked for fire resistant bedding and, and we certainly didn't want to uh, count on that, but it was uh, sort of the best to, that we could do in some cases. Um, and then using signs and reminders and incentives. And we found that it was important when a sign was put up, it wasn't just don't smoke. It was a reminder of what to do. Um, remember to um, go outside uh, if you're going to smoke. Or um, remember you want to keep your housing, follow all the rules so that the sign itself wasn't as a cue to go smoke. Um, <clears throat> and then developing... Um, when they develop problematic um, cigarette uh, habits like um, panhandling to buy cigarettes or picking up butts or things like that, that we were looking at rationing cigarettes so that those problematic behaviors didn't occur. Um, a very important intervention to address impulsivity, that reward system that's tilted in the uh, direction of immediate gratification were the use of incentives. Our clients don't learn well by consequences, so kind of thinking about what might happen as a result of the behavior in the future was kind of less effective for them. But knowing if they follow a rule that they will get a reinforcer was a concept that they could grasp and that would actually govern their behavior. Um, using concrete feedback like CO monitoring. And then also, and I guess Dr. Selby had talked about these concepts in a previous webinar, is focusing on the milestones that are occurring as a, as a result of smoking cessation. So talking about that first 24 hours and, and really providing reinforcement for that so that folks have <clears throat> a sense for the progress they're making along the journey uh, to cessation. And then, as we'll see in these case studies, environmental support. Things that we've learned, the rate of change is a rate of change in our clients is slower. They often require an extended need for NRT or maybe a return to NRT. Uh, even if sometimes we think that it might be even a placebo effect, that's something we can talk about later in the discussion. Uh, engaging environmental support, so getting help using the patches properly and also uh, in providing changes to the environment to reduce cues. And then <coughs> at Cheers at least, <clears throat> in our setting, creating a culture of change so that you can see the signs all over the place saying, ask me how I quit, and we've tried to like close the, win um, close the blinds near the window of the smoking so you're not looking at who's out in the smoking area and having the smoking area at the side of the building. So trying to um, do those little tweaks to sort of, um, sort of motivate or shove people in the right direction. Um, <clears throat> so our outcomes, I think, fairly closely resemble those um, of other stop sites from what we can gather, and I guess you guys can talk about this a little bit more. We had 11 enroll. Um, at 12 weeks, 10 were continuing, one had dropped out, and by 12 weeks, three were abstaining, six had substantially reduced, and one had little change. And then by 26 weeks, with those same 11, in, um, 11 that were enrolled, seven were 
continuing, two had dropped out, and then um, one was still in progress. The one who was in progress had been abstaining at 20 weeks, so hadn't yet finished 26 weeks. At 26 weeks, five were abstaining, which is a, a quick rate of 45%, and then 18% were reduced. One of them by 90% or 80%, and then the other by 45%. So we're we're happy with uh, with those general outcomes. Um, I'm not going to get into too much detail about this, but you can see that when we look at the individuals, they were having a nice slope of change towards um, towards the end, um, with a few clients having um, difficulty making any change at all. Um, and then when they did make a change. Uh, their COPPM actually uh, mirrored that change. One of the things I'll call attention to here is that many of our clients required um, higher doses than 21 milligrams to actually support their quitting. And when uh, it was allowed to extend people on NRT, we were um, actually finding that a lot of our clients were still in quite a high dose at 26 weeks. Um, We've modified our approach, and we're kind of getting people to um, wean by 26 weeks out of necessity, but we are finding some difficulty with sustaining change. So what you'll see uh, illustrated in, in the case studies um, are um, the interventions that we think are kind of key in the key problems that we're seeing in our population. Self-efficacy, we're looking at the peer modeling and longer periods of MI. Um, changes in reward processing, we're looking at uh, incentives to make the changes more rule-bound and comprehensible. Um, when we have people who are thinking concretely or maybe even have slowed cognitive processing, giving that concrete feedback so that they have that milestone to be proud of on the way um, to smoking cessation. And um, really focusing a lot of environmental changes. Uh, and looking with impulsivity, longer periods of treatment, because we think that lapses are more likely. And then the higher doses of nicotine really do have a nice aversion effect so that clients have, um, they're, we're using that biology, it's a very strong um, <clears throat> biological um, determinant to avoid things that make us nauseated. It's, it's, it's really kind of been bred into us. And it, it, all of that processing occurs subcortically. It's very automatic. And so even folks with lots of um, cognitive impairment can really benefit from that effect. So I'm going to pass you now to Trisha Dunbar, who's going to introduce the first case and, and talk a little bit about what happened with it. Hi everyone, I'm Trisha Dunbar, and I'm going to be talking to you about case study A. Um, as you recall, Dr. Lemsky introduced this gentleman, someone who's, uh, who has a long history with Cheers. He's a 51-year-old male with uh, severe mental illness diagnosed with schizophrenia um, that is well managed on clozapine. He first sustained his brain injury from a suicide attempt that resulted in a severe diffuse anoxical injury with ataxia and mild spasticity. He had uh, brain injury symptoms included mild disinhibition, anxiety, and impulsivity. Cognitive dysfunctions included attention, concentration, memory, judgment, and decision making. As stated, he lives in a 24-hour uh, supportive group home and independently accesses the community. Oh. You see where it's not? It's this little guy right there. All right, so one of the approaches we did was we used the environmental, behavioral, and biological uh, adaptive framework to help, uh, help us identify some factors that would con 
that would result in issues around his smoking. And when we looked at the at his environment, he did have a supportive environment where within the group home, um, where he had a good relationship with his support staff, developed a trusting relationship, and allowed staff to hold his cigarettes uh, throughout the night, but would receive his cigarettes <coughs> in the morning. The home is smoke-free, but there, there is a designated smoking area outside. And um, this individual, individual was triggered by seeing others smoking within the residence. His routine included smoking um, at coffee shops and at chairs programs. Uh, the gap, the behavior gap between say and do around his impulsivity. He had low self-efficacy as a result of living with his disability. Um, just had some reluctancy or didn't believe that he could, um, he would be able to quit smoking. Again, his habits included daily habits or routines included um, having his first his first favorite was his coffee in the morning while going for walks. And he developed he had some he had some poor coping strategies when it came to managing stress or or when he felt anxious. Um, he used cigarettes as a way to cope. The biological factors just around his, he had a lower threshold for the development of the of dependence, an altered reward system, and his cognitive impairments were mild, um, included mild memory, impaired memory, as well as mild perseveration. Uh, there was an increased risk of psychiatric disturbance, and uh, which was mo closely monitored through the clozapine clinic, where his um, his clozapine levels were were checked to prevent um, toxicity and potentially make med changes as needed. So we developed a plan based on you know we we worked with Andre uh, with this client sorry <laughs> to develop a, a quit plan and there was a difference a discrepancy between his readiness to quit and his confidence which was quite low. As uh, Dr. Lemsky stated, you know, over the course of about a year, there was some some sessions with him where she did have some discussions uh, using MI around quitting, and it took about a year. Um, but he did develop, he did, you know, we worked with him to set a quit date, and he identified some concerns about how he would, how difficult it would be for him to quit and had some self, low self-efficacy around that. Um, he was able to come up with his reasons for quitting, health being the number one and most important, self-identity, milestones around turning 50, and health screenings around that, and finances was important to him. So taking those reasons, we helped him to um, raise his the gap between his readiness to quit and confidence. Um, we developed uh, self-regulatory scripts to help him uh, address some of the low self-efficacy. Uh, we used daily orientation reviews to set him up for the day to talk about, uh, we talked about strategies that he can use to cope with or <coughs> urges. Uh, throughout his quit process. Um, he developed a savings goal. There was peer modeling and longer periods of engagement. Within the environment, we made some other changes um, where we relocated the smoking area from um, to, to be further away from the group home uh, make it to make it less appealing. Um, he agreed to a reduction of cigarettes per day, and we gradually helped him to titrate through those, starting with 15 and working his way down. Uh, this individual also had tried um, different NRTs to NRT products 
such as the inhaler and the mist, but due to his ataxia, he found that not um, uh, very beneficial for him. So he pre-packed crunchy snacks and or used hard candy. He used self-regulatory scripts to help him through periods where um, he may be bored or, or stressed out, so he would talk himself through those situ challenging situations. And, you know, as he went through um, his quit plan, we looked at several other situations um, to get him through uh, kind of uh, his quit process. So the physical, we had, uh, there were changes to his clozapine, and that was being monitored. So the dose, the loading dose started at 425, but as he decreased his smoking, um, the clozapine dose was reduced to 325. Um, uh, he was administered um, uh, off-label NRT patches, and again, closely monitored by his psychiatrist. How we addressed his anxiety, again, he used self-regulatory scripts, and some of his comorbidities uh, that we were monitoring as well, uh, hyperkalemia. He was on a fluid restriction of 1.5 liters per day. And his anxiety disorder, he used deep breathing. He used the five Ds approach, listening to music and reading. Around his, some of the challenges just around memory, uh, brain injury, uh, and brain injury and an altered reward, response to rewards, we established um, a stop routine where we were having weekly visits and we were using the CO monitor as a way to, to gauge his success. Um, that was reinforcing for him. And he was also using compensatory strategies where we would provide written notes for him that he would have within the home. So as you can see, the, the um, correlation between the COPP and his and the NRT, he was really uh, reporting. We can see that as we were prescribing the NRT, there was a there was a reduction in um, smoking and also a lowered uh, CO reading. Um, at 12 weeks, he was abstaining and continues to abstain. Hi, so here again we have Case D, a 40-year-old woman with a history of anoxic brain injury related to opioid overdose. She also has a co-occurring um, mental health and substance use disorders, um, currently living in the community in a supported brain injury residence. Um, but we didn't have as much influence over her environment as with the previous case study. So looking at the environmental, behavioral, and biological factors surrounding her smoking when she first came into the STOP program, we know that she lived in a residence where they allowed smoking and she would have guests in her apartment that would smoke with her. Um, she did have unlimited access to her finances, and those days where she would choose not to buy packs of cigarettes, she still could access cigarettes or get them in and around her building. Um, she did uh, show a lot of impulsivity. Again, it's that gap between what she says and does, and so, so showing less awareness there. And also her altered reward system, so that inability to delay gratification, and she was at increased risk for psychiatric disturbance. She was medically fragile and experienced chronic pain. Her medications included antidepressants, Zaboxone, and Seroquel.
And when looking at her self-efficacy when we first spoke with her, she identified that she was ready to quit. She had a high level of readiness because she was committed. She wanted to attain the surgery, which was a time-sensitive, concrete goal for her. But she did express that her confidence in her ability to quit was low. So beyond just quitting for the surgery, she also wanted to improve her general health and improve her finances. Some strategies we used during um, psychotherapy sessions with Dr. Lemsky. Dr. Lemsky would slip in some motivational interviewing to move her towards the change. Also, peer role modeling was effective for her. Using the incentive program, so providing her with gift cards at milestones during her quit journey and also providing the uh, concrete measure and keeping her honest with the carbon monoxide monitor. Um, and in her residential setting, um, to establish a routine and for consistency, she was supported by her group home staff who administered the NRT patches for her. Again, we set, we're talking about in her home environment, she did smoke, which was a safety hazard because she would smoke in bed while watching TV. Um, she didn't have a very busy schedule, so she spent a lot of time in her apartment and would see smokers in and around her building. So some strategies we used were to get her new furniture to replace the furniture which had burn marks in it. And she purchased a Nintendo game unit to use as a replacement behavior and to cope with the trigger of boredom. The furniture in her apartment was rearranged and she was coached on asserting herself with visitors in her apartment and asking them not to smoke while they were there. She was provided with 26 weeks of NRT patches. Um, the breakthrough NRT wasn't effective with her because she had some fine motor difficulty and she also had some dental issues. Um, with higher dosing, she received a maximum dose of 49 milligrams, which is to note because she is a very small framed woman. To deal with the trigger of boredom, she had a goal of increasing her schedule to one more day of activity. And to support her with her cognitive impairments, including memory, reasoning, and that um, altered reward system, we did use the incentive system, as mentioned, the CM monitoring, and compensatory strategies, including putting reminders in her phone that they would pop up as alerts to note what her goals were and what her progress were, was as well as signage in her room to note what her goals were and to keep track of her progress. So here we just have some graphing of her outcomes. Again, she, was, uh, she became abstinent at 12 weeks and sustained abstinence till 26 weeks, and the highest dosing again was 49 milligrams. Okay, thanks you guys. Um, so those are our cases. We've got a little bit of follow-up um, beyond 26 weeks. Oh, did I pass that? Yes. Um, at 11 months, our first case remains abstinent. He had um, some kind of near misses that staff were able to um, help him out with um, and uh, at this point, I think I spoke with him two weeks ago, he's very confident of the changes. Every once in a while when he gets upset, he thinks, oh, maybe I would have a cigarette. And then he's, he easily reminds himself that's not what he wants to do. Um, but unfortunately, the second case returned to smoking 15 cigarettes a day after eight months. And, and now I'm seeing her and we're, we're kind of talking a little bit about it. She's, she's producing some... Um, nice commitment talk about wanting to return to the smoking cessation. Now the issue for her is it's really hard for her after she got the free NRT to wrap her head around now paying for NRT to help her to meet that goal. And so we'll be working through that um, as we move forward uh, in helping her uh, in a second quit attempt. Um, 
boredom, exposure to cigarettes, and peer reduced support smoking were really difficult for DW. AB keeps himself very, very busy. Um, so in summary, um, brain injury does um, affect cognition and behavior, um, and, and so the effective strategies that we found were, you know, it, that these that increased timelines for engagement, more frequent meetings, the CO monitor, the use of incentives, concrete messaging around milestones related to quitting. Peer modeling has turned out to be really nice for us. I think um, when we first started this, uh, I think a lot of our staff, uh, and, and mind you, we the peer modeling includes the program being open to staff members. Um, and a lot of our staff were saying, you know, we'll never get these guys to quit. They were kind of um, uh, pessimistic. Yeah. I'm seeing some nods from my colleagues. And so I think um, having the signs up about the people who did quit with their faces has actually made our staff members better advocates for the smoking cessation effort um, and had actually um, influenced one or two staff members to actually join the program. So we're kind of happy about that. Um, we know that a longer follow-up period is required and that cognitive adaptations and simplified materials would be, would be helpful, something that we would like to develop in the future. Um, now, now uh, I haven't been monitoring the, um, I haven't been monitoring the uh, chat. Um, I have. Okay. Um, I have. So okay. I, I, I think we can go to that. But I think you've, you've shown the Ohio State uh, one, and I'm going to show, uh, I think we also have the help screening tool that comes okay, from. Okay, yeah. So if you can just speak um, to those before we go into the questions that they have, and then we'll just uh, I'll, I'll make a few comments and then open it up for questions. Okay, so I'll just I'll just say um, that when if you're in a position where you want to screen for acquired brain injury, there's loads of good information online. Apparently, they they've adopted the um, health uh, help um, screener as the way to do that um, across settings uh, in Ontario. All brain injury um, screenings are based on a couple of things. First, you ask um, about whether or not a person's had an illness or an injury that's resulted in loss of consciousness. And then you ask specific questions to determine um, the length of loss of consciousness and any symptoms that might have occurred after. Um, so um, the, the, um, the health questionnaire, I think, actually asks about head injury and then whether or not treatment was sought. I can um, pull that up. The length I of loss of consciousness on any persisting symptoms. I can pull that up for you in a sec. Give me a second. Uh, okay. And, uh, yeah. Um, so the, you know, this graph looks pretty complicated, but in actual fact, it really is a three-step process. Ask about the nature of the injury. List all the possible injuries um, and get a sense for how long the length loss of consciousness was and what the symptoms were and how long afterwards and how long those persisted. When you interpret, uh, this is um, the, the BrainLine website, which I will provide shameless advertisement for. Uh, we have no interest in it, but it's, it's a, um, a fantastic website that's sort of a compendium. It's a, um, an American not-for-profit that puts it out, and they really scour regularly the web for the most interesting stuff about brain injury and put it, uh, give links here. Um, to BrainLine, so it's www.brainline.org. Are we getting your screen, Peter? Can you see it? Oh, there it is, helps, yes. Yeah. So yes, have you ever had a brain injury? Were you ever seen in an emergency room? Did you ever lose consciousness? And then do you experience any of these problems? Do they persist? And so that's the HELP acronym. Yeah, and that, that's the whole question. So we can make that available to people. This is uh, as well as something we can make available. As, as you said, as a, um, a screening tool. 
Can, can we okay. go back to the slides or? Yeah. Okay. Because I don't remember what I was about. We talked also too a little bit about brain injury resources. Um, and I want to leave enough time for us to have a little bit of a chat, so I'm not going to yeah. go into detail about it. But when you interpret brain injury history, um, you want to look for early injuries with loss of consciousness, but before age 15, the most severe injury experience, so the one with the longest loss of consciousness, and then other potential causes for brain injury, including multiple injuries, like um, periods of, of um, playing sports or, or episodes of uh, being involved in abuse, um, and then looking at those, um, those screened outcomes together. So to learn more about substance use and brain injury, we are the Substance Use and Brain Injury Bridging Project. We're at www.subi.ca. Brainline um, actually references some of our materials and actually provides some really nice stuff on substance use and brain injury. Um, McGill's um, website gives really good information on um, the reward system and how that might be impacted by brain injury. And then the Ohio Valley uh, Brain Injury Organization that has training um, for substance use providers that's free about uh, cognitive impairment and adapting for cognitive impairment, and also um, uh, very clear training videos on how to screen for cognitive impairment. Lots of stuff on YouTube, too, if you take the time to Google. Um, local resources can be found through the Ontario Brain Injury Association um, generally. What you should know, though, about brain injury services is that we are an order, or many orders of magnitude smaller than the mental health and addiction system. And we know that the, um, probably the majority of folks who use services in the mental health and addiction system have some history of acquired brain injury. So they would be flooded if you referred everybody who had any history. So um, it's really much more um, uh, likely to result in something effective if you reserve those referrals for folks who have um, moderate to severe injuries, that is that they had a loss of consciousness lasting longer than 30 days and they have persisting symptoms. Um, and then you can go to the Ontario Brain Injury Association if you're outside of Toronto to find out where resources are and where um, where you might be able to refer, and within Toronto to the Toronto ABI network. Um, and um, because I'm assuming you're like me and it'll be hard to find this information when you really need it, just know that you can Google the Ontario Brain Injury Association and the Toronto ABI network to find information for referrals. So, um, uh, yeah, do, uh, before we do the acknowledgments, I think we've got about 10 minutes. So I uh, wonder if you see acknowledgments, and then I'll just go through a little bit of a discussion. I want to just uh, make some comments and then open it up for the questions that we have through the chat. Okay. Um, so I, I'd like to um, acknowledge Judy Moyer, who has helped us to organize the program here, and Amanda Muse, who is one of our other founding um, Behavior Therapy was the founding um, uh, STOP therapist, and as well as Nina uh, Gamble, who um, uh, was another fa uh, therapist in the program. And I, I neglected to put on the Ontario Neurotrauma Foundation, who provided funding for SUBI and continues to support our efforts. Great. Thank you. So here's I just want to answer something. You saw through this presentation how collaboration between STOP and, a, and an agency has been has really been effective as is reaching a population that's really hard to treat. And as you know, one of the things that we try to do to STOP is to make sure that we de reach the people who have inequities. And so you saw about an approach that takes that, in, you know, that you if you attend and teach, will realize that's what we suggest, an approach that is an environmental, behavioral, and a biological approach to people so that they can actually get the best benefit. And you can see how, in those two cases, how the team at CHUS has actually brought that to bear and not just simply uh, handed out NRP. The second thing is 
They've used really concrete ways of looking at the milestones, rewarding it, understanding that you know punishment isn't the way to go and consequences isn't the way to go. But but uh, you can you can actually take a look at having a reward system in place and having feedback. And I'm just going to hold up the CO monitor. I'm not trying to get a brand out there, but Here's what a carbon monoxide monitor, it's not a carbon dioxide monitor, but the carbon monoxide monitor is very tactile. It gets people to blow into it, and when they blow into it, you get a number, and that number becomes a target. So if you can get to less than two, you know you've, you've reached out of a non-smoker. Uh, and, and again, that becomes a, a way to not only validate self-report and people who might have difficulty telling you the number of cigarettes they smoke, but it also helps you validate and help them give feedback if they can take that information. So, so I think this is a, a good example of using a systematic approach uh, with the population that is otherwise uh, could be uh, left to, 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 to real great harm. Uh, and as you know, many people with, a, with brain injuries can land up having uh, with those cognitive deficits land up uh, uh, essentially putting themselves at risk for fires, et cetera, whether themselves or others. And so uh, uh, let's just go uh, through the questions, and I'm going to scroll back up to the beginning, where it, it's great to, first of all, welcome people from across the country and, uh, and, and from everywhere. So it, it's really nice to have that. And I'm just going to scroll down to um, to this issue around a question that came up. Uh, and uh, uh, do you use any specific techniques when addressing alcohol-induced brain injury? And I think let's figure out that one. So, uh, you know, Carolyn, I think with us, if you're talking about Wernicke's or Korsakov, where it affects the parts of the brain where memories are formed, then yes, that is, you know, the interesting thing with that is that they may forget how to smoke. But I don't know if you've had any cases uh, yeah, actually, of course funny, um, We have had a number of cases where they've had that, that severe amnesia that comes from more Wernicke's, and yeah. they forgot they smoked until somebody reminded them, and then they started smoking again. And what happens, what winds up happening, and in fact with their alcohol use as well, that they'll um, use traditional approaches like sending them to um, um, AA or, or whatever. We, I'm thinking about a couple of clients we've had in particular, and the advice that I gave was simply remove, remove the cues to the substance. So stop yeah. talking about it. Stop asking him if he's going to drink. Stop asking him about these things and, 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 and um, introduce things in the immediate environment that would be an active distraction of those, and that's a much more effective approach. So you, you actually, what you're doing is um, taking advantage of the fact that the person is, is much more bound to the current moment um, and using that current moment to promote the healthy behaviors that you want to see, as opposed to thinking about it as an addiction. Because in, in, in many ways, with the loss of continuity that comes with that severe amnesia, that, that ship sailed. Yeah, and again, I think if, if you're talking about that, I guess it speaks to what Claire is asking about specifically. Yeah, I mean, uh, to what Claire asked about, but also what Brenda asked about people with FASD diagnosed adults. And I think it's whether it's an acquired or congenital or or a brain injury, whether it's traumatic or otherwise, if people's frontal lobes are compromised from a disease condition that affects either planning or processing or memory, then especially with memory, for example, our patients with dementia, we've had people who have overplanned that transition from home to the nursing home for dementia. And, and in a sense, in essence, we said, like, let's assess how severe the dementia is. And when they move the environment, they just forget to ask about smoking and auto withdrawal. And we had one case where they simply, you know, transitioned the person. And, and we said the intervention when they transition is if the person has cravings, give them, you know, give them a, a, a small, can, uh, give them a candy that they can't choke on. And essentially, this, it was a smoothest transition. There was no withdrawal. There was no need. It was just the complete cues were completely different. There was no loss. And so I think we have to come up with 
uh, differently to this issue, as you rightly pointed out. And I hope that, you know, I think that's what you're saying, if, that, if, I'm, if I'm paraphrasing correctly. Absolutely. And I think that uh, in milder, um, with FASD particularly, um, which affects the reward system, the things that we've been talking about are offering the rewards um, and um, providing help with planning and problem solving and impulsivity um, would be very effective in that population. And um, they, they closely resemble our folks with moderate TBI. Um, right. And also, in, even in mild um, alcoholic-related encephalopathies where there isn't the dense amnesia, there is more, uh, greater difficulty with executive functioning. And in particular, what you find is that folks have a tendency to be more concrete in their thought process and also a bit slower. And so um, they may have difficulty in generalizing strategies from one setting to another and seeing uh, the relationship um, very clearly between changes in their own behavior and changes in, in, um, uh, and changes in their outcomes. So they, the cause-effect relationships kind of break down a little bit for them. Um, yeah. And that, that's one of the things that um, you'll notice, like AA takes um, that into account by giving chips. Uh, it makes the milestones clearer. Uh, so um, taking a page from some of the things that you do with 12-step, um, like very clear, concrete messages, um, very clear tasks towards um, sobriety, like the 12 steps, and then the, the sort of reinforcers that you get for the milestones along the way become very critical um, intervention strategies. So I think Diane asked that question. It's a good segue, and I guess we have a few minutes, so 